Um, so my name is uh, Willem Staas. I'm, uh, I will be moderating the first session uh, because straight after this one there will be a second session. So very much also encourage you to stay on. Uh, but for the first session uh, now, which will last uh, up until 3.30 p.m. Uh, more or less, uh, we will talk about uh, increased pressure on Syrian refugees in neighboring host countries. Um, and yeah, more specifically, the, the pressure on them to return to Syria, um, the threat of uh, being forcibly deported uh, to yeah, a country situation where conditions for safe return uh, are, uh, of course, still not met. Um, so yeah, just as a very brief, um, yeah, setting the scene, the, the, talkers, uh, the, the speakers will talk more about it, of course, in detail. Um, this is, of course, yeah, quite an... Um, an important issue which has uh, gained yeah, all the more uh, importance and yeah, momentum in a sense in recent years, recent months, uh, and especially in the case of Lebanon, also uh, recent days and weeks, uh, where we have had, uh, if you look at the situation in Turkey, uh, of course, we, we had elections uh, in May last year, the, the run-up to the elections uh, saw like an uh, enormous uptick in the, the anti-Syrian uh, refugee rhetoric. Uh, in the context of this electoral campaign, but also uh, yeah, ever since, of course, tensions have not gone down, uh, to the contrary. Uh, and then we, we, of course, have the, the situation in Lebanon where uh, yeah, pressure on Syrian refugees has been high, uh, uh, is high, has been high uh, for quite a while now, uh, but especially in the past couple of weeks uh, and, and more, more specifically uh, since the, the murder on, on a local uh, Lebanese politician, uh, yeah, tensions have really gone uh, through the roof. Um, with all uh, consequences in terms of intimidation, violence, um, and yeah, people just uh, going after Syrian refugees uh, in the streets. Um, and we're also, it's a very timely moment, uh, unfortunately, uh, with also uh, European Commission President von der Leyen uh, about to uh, depart for Beirut. Uh, she, will she will be in Beirut on Thursday, 2nd of May, uh, where she will most likely announce some kind of uh, EU-Lebanon uh, migration deal along the lines uh, of the recent deals uh, yeah, recently struck between the EU, um, uh, Egypt and Tunisia. So, in short, a lot uh, to discuss today. Um, we have one and a half hours, so hopefully we can uh, touch on most, if not all of it. Uh, bear with us. Um, but yeah, we have uh, four speakers uh, to guide you through, through all these uh, recent developments. Um, so, first we have uh, Rahda al Sheikh uh, Ali. Um, yeah, apologize in advance for massacring your name uh, while pronouncing. Uh, but yeah, uh, Ragda is a project coordinator at uh, SCM, uh, where she leads the work on uh, documentation, monitoring of uh, violations of refugee rights uh, in the neighboring host countries. Um, she has been doing that uh, since April 2030, uh, 2023. Um, and before, uh, yeah, she has worked uh, on the, the same issues uh, in, in various capacities. Uh, we also have uh, Hiba Saidin from Human Rights Watch, so senior researcher at Human Rights Watch, uh, where she investigates uh, human rights violations, abuses, uh, with a particular focus on uh, Syria and Jordan, uh, based in Amman. Also, uh, and Hiba has also recently, uh, or is the author of a recent Human Rights Watch report uh, on rights violations uh, across the north of Syria. Uh, yeah, about which she will uh, tell you uh, more in a second. Uh, we also have uh, Salah Aldebach uh, on my left, uh, so independent human rights activist, uh, Syrian refugee himself, who yeah, unfortunately will be able to, to tell you uh, from a very uh, first-hand uh, account of what it is to be forcibly deported. Uh, so Salah was uh, deported himself uh, from Turkey, back to Syria, managed to uh, return back from Syria to Turkey uh, and is now living in France uh, and uh, was also very, very eager to be here in person because uh, normally uh, or Salah was supposed to join online. Uh, but as I understood, uh, he took a six hour drive uh, from France uh, this morning to, to be here in person. 
Um, and then last but not least, I have my uh, Triple Eleven colleague, uh, Shaima Mosafa, who is the pro project coordinator, uh, Middle East, at the organization. Uh, and yeah, among many other uh, responsibilities and duties at Triple Eleven, uh, she has also been coordinating a research project that Triple uh, Eleven has been implementing in the past two years uh, together with uh, various local uh, CSO partners uh, on the situation of Syrian refugees in Turkey. Um, so that's for a brief introduction for the speakers. Um, in terms of the outline, we'll uh, work in two rounds. Um, so we, yeah, as I said, we have uh, about one and a half hours. So uh, in the first round, uh, more or less one hour in total. Um, yeah, I will just ask the, uh, the speakers uh, to give a short intervention of uh, 10 minutes each on uh, the issues uh, of their expertise. Uh, to then be followed uh, with uh, about 30 minutes uh, Q&A uh, with, with you, with the audience. Um, very practically, there's translation between Arabic and English uh, and the other way around, uh, both for the online audience um, and also, of course, for the people in the room. So if you have not uh, managed to get a headset already, uh, there are a couple of them in the back of the room. Uh, and yeah, of course, in case you have a question uh, for the online audience, uh, please type it in the, the Q&A. Uh, so um, one of our colleagues at uh, STG will uh, keep an eye on that so that you can make sure to factor this in uh, during the Q&A uh, round. Uh, and of course, uh, for the audience uh, here uh, attending in person, uh, yeah, just simply raise your hand uh, during the Q&A. Uh, that will start around uh, 3 p.m. So... Yeah, uh, we'll start with the first round and with uh, Shaima. Um, so yeah, Shaima. Um, okay. So yeah, as, as mentioned, um, Shaima uh, and Triple Eleven, uh, we have been uh, doing this research project in the past uh, two years, uh, which uh, has led to the publication of uh, various reports. Um, but one uh, report is specifically, so a report that was published in January 2024, uh, which specifically zoomed in on the, uh, the legal limbo that Syrian refugees in Turkey are faced with. So, um, yeah, I of course know what is meant with that term. Um, but if you can uh, elaborate, explain a bit to the audience, like uh, what does it mean like this legal limbo? And yeah, more generally, the, if you can uh, share a bit of the, the key highlights, the recommendations, uh, the, no, recommendations we'll get uh, in the second round, uh, key highlights and, and uh, yeah, main findings of this uh, state of limbo report. Yeah, the Okay, this is on. Thank you, William, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, so yeah, before I get to the state of limbo, I just want to uh, put an overall, uh, uh, let's say, overview of the current deals that are happening now, and maybe to just go a bit back to 2016 for the EU-Turkey deal, before I get into the situation uh, that the that uh, Syrian refugees are currently uh, living in in uh, Turkey specifically, so mainly uh, just as a let's say as an example of also the EU deals that are happening now. So maybe just also to reflect on whether this is something that is working or not in terms of the situation of refugees in the host countries. So basically, we could see that in 2016, the EU-Turkey deal has focused mainly on three or four main things. Uh, first thing is that uh, Turkey would secure the borders and uh, make sure that there is no illegal crossings to, uh, to uh, Greek. And for every Syrian refugee who crosses illegally to Greek, um, uh, the, he is supposed, or she, are, uh, she is supposed to go back to Turkey, and uh, the Turkey would get to receive six billion euros uh, in terms of economic uh, um, support. Uh, to support also the situation of refugees in, in Turkey. And also for every refugee that is returned to Turkey, uh, the EU has to resettle one refugee to the EU countries. Uh, looking back at this, um, it was assumed that back then, Turkey was a safe place for Syrians to be in. However, uh, even back then, the situation was a bit questionable. So if we look back and see up until now, 
does the situation, did the situation get better or did it get worse? And we can clearly see that it is not getting better in, in any way. Um, uh, as Willem mentioned, uh, we have conducted rounds of conversations inside Turkey with Syrian refugees who are already residing there. And the main focus was the state of limbo of refugees in Turkey. And what we meant by the state of limbo is that Syrian refugees in Turkey, they don't have any prospects in terms of living, security, uh, progress whatsoever, especially that they are not getting the support, let's say, in, in uh, services, uh, even though there are laws and regulations that are controlling, let's say, the situation. However, we see that the application on the ground is not as uh, it's supposed to be. Uh, from the conversations, we're able to uh, at least uh, highlight the main concerns of the refugees uh, in Turkey. Uh, first and the most important uh, concern was the fear of deportation. So currently uh, refugees uh, or Syrians residing, uh, yeah, the term refugee because they do, in Turkey they do not refer to, uh, to Syrians as, as refugees because they do have the temporary protection. However, Syrians in Turkey, um, uh, they mainly uh, expressed the conversations, just to highlight the conversations, were uh, done with more than 800 uh, Syrians residing inside Turkey and with random questions on legal situation, uh, work permits, uh, residencies, uh, documentation, access to services, access to the labor market, and among others. Um, and as I mentioned, mainly the, the, the main concern was the fear of deportation, specifically after the uh, continuous uh, cases of deportation that we've been hearing about, the cases that were documented, the human rights violations that are happening in deportation centers, um, uh, people, uh, refugees in Turkey, Syrians in Turkey are mainly uh, not uh, even uh, feeling safe in terms of even getting out sometimes because if you get in a single situation which any one of us can get into, it might get you to the point of being put in a car, driv driven to the border and then deported without any legal uh, 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 basis whatsoever. Um, so um, this was the main concern, as I mentioned, in terms of uh, deportations. Um, we, can, uh, we can see that the increase in discrimination that was mainly based on a lot of hate speech, a lot of in, uh, inc incitement against refugees uh, in Turkey, specifically during the, before the elections and after the elections, where the opposition parties were mainly focusing on the refugees on the Syrians or the presence of Syrians in, in Turkey uh, specifically and they were scapegoated for the situation and that okay they are the main reason for like lack of uh, uh, employment, uh, lack of uh, um, let's say uh, uh, the economic crisis also in, in Turkey is also uh, one of the uh, causes of the presence of, of Turkey, uh, of Syrians in, uh, in Turkey. Um, uh, also, uh, the lack of access to legal documentation. So basically, even though there are some laws and regulations that can control uh, the, the uh, um, uh, people to uh, get or to have access to those documentations, but most of the time they are very complicated texts, they are very complicated procedures that people are not even able to understand in one way or another. Uh, also, the, the discrimination has also caused the, the fact that people were not able to get access because the decisions are mainly based on a one person's uh, opinion in an office in a certain province and then like they would decide whether this person would get an extension to their uh, residency, whether this person is allowed to have a work permit or not. So more, more or less it became of a personal decision rather than uh, something linked to a, a process or a legal uh, operation that people can get into. Uh, all of this situation did not only affect the fact that people are not able to get the residencies or work permits, but even housing. So we, we have a lot of respondents who mentioned that if they are not even able to get access to housing in one way or another because especially after the earthquake and the um, and for example in Gaziantep and the uh, uh, provinces that were affected by the earthquake we noticed that 
there was a high rate of Syrian refugees denied uh, 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 housing just because they are Syrians and not because it, there were uh, uh, there is of course a high uh, let's say uh, request at that or high demand for housing at that moment however the denial or like the denial for housing for uh, refugees for Syrians was mainly just because they are Syrians uh, we have also had a lot of um, personal um, contacts, let's say, uh, in a way, like because we work with several uh, uh, organizations that are already residing and operating inside Turkey, a lot of uh, uh, team members, a lot of colleagues with those uh, organizations, they had directly faced discrimination in one way or another. A lot of them, they were denied residency, even though they were in Turkey for a long time. Whenever they want to renew their residencies, they were like not given the time. Basically, people who, who were getting residencies for two or three years, now they get it for like four weeks or like two months making them in a situation where they do not know what is next because they have been built a life let's say in this country but now it's more or less more complicated to even have access to uh, uh to to stay in the country so this has uh, complicated uh, a lot their uh, situation you, you can tell me if i exceeded the time <laughs> okay <laughs> because i can go on forever so I know. so yeah <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So the 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 main issues uh, um, were not only linked to let's say the uh, absence of support, but also language barriers uh, uh, were of the reasons that people were not able to let's say understand the processes or have access to uh, to those services, uh, mainly because also nothing in another language is is available and even when you request which is at, at many points is a right in in, uh, in turkey and that the the um, presence of translation in offices is also something that uh, refugees or syrians can request however most of the time it's not available so it ends up in someone who's going to work on their documents but at the end of the day they do not get the support or the service that they need because they cannot understand the process and thus denied uh, uh, documentation whatsoever just because they didn't understand the situation or the the process uh, we've heard a lot of cases or like we've documented a lot of cases of harassment in a way where people um, were uh, kicked out especially during the earthquake and with the earthquake responses a lot of people were also uh, denied access to uh, to aid uh, where they were like kicked out of camps, uh, they were uh, refused uh, to uh, get, let's say, food parcels, which mainly we're talking about basic services and we're not talking about, let's say, complicated things that someone might be, yes. So the situation uh, is not getting in any way better. So if we just reflect now and see, uh, is it worth going through all those deals that we're talking about? Already uh, the EU had done a deal with Turkey with 6 billion euros. More deals are, are also on the way with different countries for the same situation, yet we see that the situation did not change in any way. We don't see any change in the life of the people, the Syrians or the Syrians who are residing in any of the neighboring countries to Syria. And the situation or prospects are very limited because if we talk about the prospects, what does a Syrian have it's mainly, I think, three <laughs> options. Going back to Syria in case it's, it's safe, and we all know that it is not safe to return to Syria. Being in a neighboring country, and now the neighboring countries are becoming more and more aggressive towards the presence of refugees and Syrians in the countries or resettling to Europe. And we see that the, the rate of resettlement is not uh, up to the to the to the numbers in, in in any way so for example here in belgium i i guess it's not more than four thousand you can correct me if i'm wrong but i don't i guess it's not more than four thousand applications per year for for syrians and yet we are expecting that countries 
neighboring countries are also, they have to deal with large numbers without taking the responsibility of being um, of the EU countries in, in one way or another. And streaming funding just for the sake of putting funding and we're doing our part and just putting funding, I don't think it has proven that it is the, the ultimate solution for the situation because just streaming funding without any, uh, uh, let's say, I'm not going to say guidelines or whatsoever, but at least, at least with the basics of respecting the human rights of the refugees and the Syrians and the neighboring countries uh, whatsoever. So I see you're looking at me and <laughs> I can stop. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, no, thanks a lot, Shaima. Uh, and maybe just to, to add uh, on the numbers part, um, I don't know the numbers specifically for, for Belgium by heart, but uh, if you zoom out and look at the, the number of people, uh, Syrians from Turkey being resettled, uh, being resettled to the EU since 2016, since the EU-Turkey deal, uh, you see that there's uh, roughly 40,000 people that have been resettled. So that's uh, since 2016, eight years. Uh, meaning, on average, uh, 5,000 Syrians from Turkey uh, that uh, got uh, resettled uh, into the EU. Of course, if you contrast that to the, the overall refugee population in Turkey, uh, or the Syrian refugee population in Turkey only, because of course other nationals uh, present, uh, but yeah, if you contrast that to the uh, 3.5 uh, million Syrians in Turkey, yeah, you get a an idea of uh, how uh, insufficient uh, the EU's uh, resettlement efforts are. And yeah, as mentioned by Shaima, like if uh, year after year, if like uh, access to any kind of durable solutions uh, for Syrian refugees are, are being cut off, like uh, safe return is not an option, uh, increasingly hostile situation in host countries like Turkey, but also in Lebanon and other countries, and then resettlement uh, numbers are at an all time low, then of course one shouldn't be overly surprised to see uh, Syrians um, yeah, figuring as the, the number one nationality uh, in the yeah, in the EU's own statistics. So if you, for example, look back at uh, the 2023 uh, numbers uh, from the European Asylum Agency, so the, the overall number of people who applied for asylum, uh, you not only see that uh, there's like uh, 1.4 million people who did so uh, throughout 2023, which is a record high number since uh, 2016, but also that Syrians uh, are by far the number one uh, nationality uh, in the statistics uh, with uh, around 181,000 uh, Syrians who applied for asylum, uh, which shouldn't come at a as a surprise. Um, but yeah, turning to, to, to Salah now, um, Salah, um, yeah, Shaima has explained a lot about uh, how basically in recent years the, yeah, the public sentiment in Turkey has uh, uh, drastically shifted uh, against Syrian refugees and also how that has uh, yeah, basically translated in a shift in policy uh, with more discrimination, less access to uh, legal documentation, uh, Kimlix uh, being cancelled, um, but yeah, most importantly, um, the, the number of people who are uh, being forcibly deported uh, massively, I would say, uh, on the rise. So, yeah, Shaima um, has done that by providing statistics, research, uh, and so on, but that's of course one part of the story. The other part is, yeah, how it is as a Syrian to be deported. Unfortunately, okay. you were one of these uh, Syrians who got deported, who then managed to get back. So can you tell us a bit more on yeah, your experience and like the different uh, yeah, parts and, and steps in this, yeah, let's call it deportation okay. journey for, for lack of a better term? Thank you. Uh, حقيقة في مشاكل عديدة عم يعيش اللاجئ السوري بتركيا طبعا أهمها وأكثرها تعيدا هي الترحيل من خلال تجاربة من خلال عملي ألاف القصص التي شاهدتها بعيني وعيشت مأساة الكثيرين خلال عملي كناشط حقوقي وكمحامي متدرب في عدد من مكاتب المحاماة في غاز عنتاب معظمها كانت تنتهي بلا حل أو لن يقلها بصراحة الحل الوحيد والأكثر ألما كان هو أن يرحل اللاجئ تحت مسمى العودة الطوعية أو اللا طوعية في أرض تطالها آلاف القذائف يوميا من نظام الأسد وروسيا ويترك اللاجئ ليواجه مصيره مجهولا أقلها البحث عن مكان يؤويه وهو الذي رحل بدون أن يعطى فرصة ليستجمع, ليستجمع أشياءه وأماله وحتى ملابسه وأقلها ضررا 
أن يوقف قيد الكملك بطاقة الحماية المؤقتة فيضطر للتوقيع كل شهر وإن تأخر شهرا واحدا فمصيره الترحيل لذا سأتكلم عن قصتي باختصار لأنها تمثل قصص آلاف السوريين في تركيا فبعد معاناة طويلة لإتمام مراحل دراسة الجامعية في كلية الحقوق والتنقل بين بلدان لبنان وسوريا ومصر وآخرها تركيا وعندما اقتربت من تحقيق حلمي وفي ذروة نشاطي وقمة عطائي افترت علي الصحف التركية بالتحريض على الدولة والشعب وهذا غير صحيح بسبب دعوة كيدية من أحد السياسيين النافذين الأتراك بسبب قيامي ومهامي بالدفاع عن حقوق اللاجئين السوريين في تركيا ومن دون مسوغ قانوني تم احتجاز والدتي الدكتورة غادة حمدون كرهينة في سابقة لم تحدث ولم تحصل من قبل في تركيا تم احتجازها لمدة يومين وتهديدي بها تهديدي بأنهم سوف يقتلونها وتهديدي بأنهم سوف يرحلونها فأجبرت على تسليم نفسي عندما لم أجد أي, لم أجد أي مسوغ قانوني لهذا الفعل سوى أنه يشبه إلى حد كبير الذي تفعله مخابرات نظام بشار الأسد ومن دون أي اعتبار لسبب وجودي في تركيا وأنني طالب على وشك التخرج قامت إدارة الهجرة التركية بترحيلي قصرا إلى مناطق النفوذ التركي في سوريا إنما حدث معي ما كان إلا بداية لعصر جديد عنوانه انتهاك كرامة وحقوق وحرية اللاجئ السوري في تركيا ضاربين عرض الحائط بكل القوانين الدولية التي تحفظ حق اللاجئ في الحياة والعيش الكريم يعني قصتي مع بتختزل كثير قصص ناس تقريبا من حوالي سنتين عم تستمر نهج سياسه سياسه الداخليه التركيه باتباعها تجاه السوريين باستغلال الوضع الداخلي التركي تحريض على اللاجئ السوري اللاجئ السوري حاليا اصبح هو مادي دسمي للاعلام للسياسيين الاتراك مع الأسف اللاجئ السوري حاليا إذا بده ينتقل من من مكان إلى مكان فهو بده يعني يستهلك نفسيا وماديا ومعنويا حتى أصبح الآن بالنسبة للسوريين الموجودين بتركيا ليست سوريا وحيدة غير آمنة بالنسبة لهم لا تركيا أيضا غير آمنة تركيا أيضا غير آمنة بالنسبة للاجئين السوريين وأيضا يبحثون على مكان آمن آخر للعيش فيه Thanks a lot, Salah, for sharing that. Um, maybe turning to Erkda, um, to the situation in Lebanon, uh, yeah, where the situation is uh, equally bleak, uh, if not even uh, yeah, more bleak than, uh, than Turkey. So can, can you tell a bit more about, uh, basically, yeah, uh, update the audience a bit on what has happened uh, in Lebanon, specifically in the past couple of weeks, how that, yeah, basically fits in, like, a broader trend, a broader pattern that we have been seeing, especially in the past uh, year or so. Uh, and maybe from that point onwards, also share a couple of thoughts, if any, on yeah, this, um, this visit by uh, European Commission President von der Leyen, mm -hmm. uh, who's, uh, yeah, who will go to Beirut uh, on Thursday to yeah, uh, most likely announce some kind of EU-Lebanon deal. Uh, yeah. Hello everyone and many thanks for joining us today and thank you Salah for sharing your story. Uh, regarding the situation in Lebanon which hosts more than 1.5 million of Syrian refugees and 90% of them live under the poverty line. Lebanon didn't sign the 1951 uh, convention nor its complementing protocol of 1967. It does also not have a national legislation on, uh, on refugees, only the 1962 law on entry and stay. Includes six articles related to refugees. Uh, this do not provide a clear framework uh, guaranteeing the legal security of refugees. Uh, Lebanon uh, doesn't recognize that the status of refugees uh, granted by the UNHCR to Syrian in Lebanon. It even deals with them from a criminal law perspective uh, on the ground of illegal entry or stay in the country. Uh, the government adopted in 2014 a policy on refugees uh, aiming to reduce the number of Syrian refugees in Lebanon and encouraging them to return home. And regarding the situation of uh, Syrian refugees in Lebanon, only 17% of Syrian refugees in Lebanon have a valid residence permit. 
that means that almost 85% 85, 85 of them struggle with the real challenges in their daily life. Uh, this includes lim limitation of, uh, on the freedom of uh, movement, of, of fear of security checkpoints, uh, prevent of education, of humanitarian assistance, and of registration of birth, uh, marriage, and death. In 2021, uh, 21, the Lebanese General Security Directorate admitted that it had uh, adopted since uh, 20, uh, 2019 uh, more than 6,000 uh, Syrian and it uh, described the event as a voluntary uh, return. The Lebanese authorities uh, exert a, a semestic pressure to force Syrians to return to their country. This includes forcible deportation of these who entered the unlawfully, uh, destruction and the arson of refugees camp, the targetings in their workplace of Syrian work, who have no work permits, arrest of Syrians at checkpoints in certain neighborhoods uh, to, to deport them, and uh, the rating of homes to arrest and uh, deport families. Uh, upon their return, Syrians uh, faced the uh, risk of arrest, torture, and forcibly military drafting. In an, an interview with the Syrian Center for Media and Freedom of Expression, uh, a Syrian refugee in Beirut reported the raid of the Lebanese army on members of his family in Qub uh, Elias camp in Al Al they arrested and deported 60 uh, young persons wanted, to, uh, wanted for military drafting in Syria. Uh, the deportees uh, included the witness's brother, who had a refugee certificate from the UNHCR. Yet he was deported and started his military uh, training in Dara. Another witness reported uh, the arrest of a 20 Syrian young person while they were uh, on their way to work in earlier April. Uh, in April. Uh, they were arrested uh, uh, in, uh, in a checkpoint, uh, but, but in reality it was running by Hezbollah. They were forcibly returned to Syria, including a cousin of the witness uh, lawfully residing in Lebanon in addition to an HCR document uh, arresting his refugee state. The family confirmed that he is currently uh, uh, arrested in Sednaya prison. Uh, Syrians are facing a surge of violent attack following the killing of Pascal Suleiman, a senior official of uh, Lebanese force. On Tuesday, the Lebanese Secretary the Ministry called for a reduction of the number of Syrians in uh, Lebanon. Um, also, there is a report that the local residents in different Lebanese towns are issuing threats of uh, mass effect eviction uh, against Syrians. Uh, Cyprus president uh, recently visited Lebanon to address the pressure issue, the Syrian refugee crisis. It also wants the EU to de de declare uh, some parts of Syria safe, uh, which Cyprus uh, says uh, could assist the returns under the strict conditions. Uh, since Syria is still uh, considered uh, an unsafe country, uh, this will put the refugees who will be deported at risk of death, uh, death and arrest. Mm, thank you. Thanks a lot, Gaida. Um, you want to share any thoughts on like potential deal between EU and, and Lebanon, or maybe come to that in a later point? Okay. Then uh, turning to Hiba. Um, so Hiba, yeah, as mentioned in my introduction, uh, you've been working uh, for Human Rights Watch uh, for uh, yeah, quite a while uh, now, uh, but you recently also uh, authored a report uh, on conditions for uh, return inside Syria, or yeah, basically. Um, if I can uh, conclude uh, the, the lack of conditions for safe return uh, in northern Syria. Um, so I was wondering if you can yeah, share with us a couple of main findings, takeaways from that report. Uh, but of course, yeah, maybe from that point onwards also zoom out to like yeah, the broader issue of yeah, the, the one million question, I guess, uh, now when is Syria uh, safe for return or not? Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think we can end it by saying Syria is categorically unsafe. I don't know if this thing is working. Oh, there it's working. Um, yeah, so we, we, Human Rights Watch recently published a report on conditions in Turkish occupied territories of northern Syria. Uh, and that's just one area, one zone of control. We're talking about a fragmented Syria currently. Um, you know, our main finding really although Turkish authorities have really wanted to designate or um, you know, declare these areas as safe zones, 
they are anything but that. And that's what our report and other reports by UN agencies and other human rights organizations have shown over the last several years of Turkish occupation. Um, these areas, like others in Syria, are really um, characterized by insecurity, by lawlessness, uh, by criminality, um, you know, in Turkish occupied territories now, which are basically two separate territories of northern Syria that border uh, uh, Turkey. Um, you know, you've got many different uh, armed groups that operate under one umbrella, but that's, there's no real, you know, unified command structure there. Um, these uh, militias or armed groups are, you know, haphazardly uh, kind of operating in these areas, uh, dividing or vying for control, not just at, you know, the, the town or city level, but really at a neighborhood and street level um, inside uh, these territories. Uh, we have documented arbitrary arrests, enforced disappearances, torture and ill treatment in detention facilities, everything we've seen and we've documented in regime-held areas and government-held areas, we are seeing replicated in uh, uh, Turkish-occupied territories, and we can get into some of the other zones as well, but you know, we're seeing those same horrors being replicated um, in Turkish-occupied territories and under the, the direct supervision, really, of Turkish authorities. So while you've got you know, the Syrian National Army or you know, that umbrella of, of over 25, 30 armed groups. Uh, we've got Turkish intelligence uh, and military intelligence agencies operating directly in those areas. So they, you know, it's not just that Turkey is kind of turning a blind eye to the abuses that we see taking place in these territories, but that this is kind of part of, part of a policy um, of really, you know, weakening the Kurdish presence in some of these areas. So we're talking about Afrin, which is used to be majority Kurdish, uh, you know, Ras al Ain, Tel Abyad, very diverse, uh, uh, um, you know, regions that, um, we, and, and you've got Turkey trying to, to create this, what they call a safe area to return refugees to, but also to protect their border from what they see as a threatening Kurdish uh, presence. Um, we're seeing housing, land, and property violations also similar to what we've witnessed in government-held areas. So there's, you know, these things are happening. Um, it, you know, the same practices we see uh, also taking place, even at you know anecdotal levels uh, of, of you know what people have told us about what's what's happening in those areas. Um, you know. While, while we're seeing these areas kind of, we're seeing lawlessness reign in these areas, we're also seeing Turkey now increasingly uh, deporting uh, Syrian refugees to areas like Tel Abyad, which is an incredibly remote area that a lot of Syrian refugees in Turkey have no meaningful ties to you know, whatsoever. Um, so beyond the fact that these areas are, you know, people there are at risk from a personal security aspects, um, but also, you know, humanitarian um, conditions are really dire in those areas. People are being sent there and have no way to kind of move on to other places that they might, you know, in the face of things, want to move to. So you're seeing dangerous smuggling happening across some of these areas. Um, you know, uh, we, we, and again, this is really just one example, uh, this you know, one zone of control of what such the situation is like across Syria. Um, that kind of lawlessness, uh, that kind of criminality we see in every zone of control. In government-held areas, we see that state structures have really devolved into, uh, you know, organized crime. In other areas, uh, um, you know, in the Northeast and in the Northwest under Hayat uh, Tahrir al-Sham, we also see, um, you know, just uh, incredibly dangerous conditions, humanitarian crises, economic crises across the board. Um, and, you know, even with everything that my, my colleagues here have said about conditions in neighboring countries, we don't see people trying to run back uh, uh, to Syria. We don't 
you know, there's a recent survey actually that um, shows that the majority of Syrians, uh, of Syrian refugees have really seized all efforts to try and return to Syria. And concerns about safety are amongst, you know, um, the biggest concerns. Um, and of course, the regime's presence uh, is a big uh, indicator as well. So there's no real effort by, uh, you know, Syrians to return en masse or in any concerted um, way. And um, in terms of, and here I've kind of lost my thought a little bit, uh, lost my train of thought. Um, but yeah, I wanted to speak a bit to this idea or this flawed concept of safe zones because we're hearing now also, um, you know, EU leaders uh, you know, considering to declare some areas in Syria as, as safe. And really, again, I repeat, no part of Syria is fit for safe and dignified returns. And the economic condition is part and parcel of that. So Human Rights Watch has really taken the position um, that, you know, economic conditions should also be considered when thinking about whether uh, a certain destination is safe or fit uh, uh, for returns. Um, and so back to this flawed idea of, of safe zones, Human Rights Watch has done a lot of work, not just in Syria, but in other conflicts around the world where there's been, um, uh, you know, an inclination to, to declare certain areas as safe. And what we found is that these places are really, um, you know, rarely ever actually safe. Um, they may, you know, they, they, uh, they give this, um, perception that outside of those safe areas that you know you can indiscriminately target civilians whereas whether you're in the safe zone or outside of the safe zone you should receive the same protections when it comes to civilian protections um, you know in certain areas they might become you know the deliberate target because they've been declared a safe zone um, similar to what we see with camps for for the displaced uh, you know, there's a lack of access to employment, uh, you know, an increased uh, possibility of sexualized uh, violence against women. Um, you know, these are secured areas, let's say, but, um, you know, they don't really offer uh, uh, that kind of safety. And so I think it's, it's really important when it comes to making uh, policy decisions to look at the limitations of, of um, of safe zones. And again, safe zones could mean many things to many different people. You know, you might talk about demilitarized zones or no-fly zones or, um, you know, just declaring a, a city, you know, by regional breakdown safe because you don't see a lot of criminal activity in that area. Um, so it, it's also not a very clearly defined concept. Um, and, and we really need to reassess how we look at and how we define and how we understand safe zones, um, especially now as we see more and more of this uh, narrative around, um, you know, finding areas that are safe. So I think just to end on this, this entire ramble, uh, <laughs> um, you know, as much as the international community wishes it to be so, Syria is not safe. No part of it is safe. Um, and, and, you know, you can't wish something to happen uh, because, you know, the root causes of that, of the conflict have not been addressed. Uh, they remain alive and well today and not just in government held areas, but as, you know, our reporting and other reporting has shown, uh, it has spread to other zones of control, same practices uh, uh, multiplied and replicated elsewhere. Um, and no real, you know, move or action towards getting at the root causes of why people fled in the pr first place or why people um, rose up in the first place. And uh, maybe I'll end it there unless there was any other point you wanted me to make. That was already a lot. Uh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. thanks so much, Hiba. Um, and yeah, maybe to also briefly add on that point, I think um, yeah, in addition to the excellent work by Human Rights Watch, but also by Students for Truth and Justice, SCM, and, and many other uh, local, international human rights organizations, just also wanted to um, yeah, raise your attention uh, to recent reports also by various authoritative uh, UN bodies. So you also had, uh, in the past two months alone, you both had the UN Commission of Inquiry for Syria that in March issued a report that basically documented how 
um, yeah, since October 2023 uh, that we have basically, or that Syria has been uh, experiencing the, the worst escalation in violence uh, since 2022. Um, and again, there the Commission also, as it did in previous reports, uh, very clearly, um, in very unambiguous uh, terms, reiterated the message, Syria is not safe for return. Um, and that was one month after uh, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, so the UN Human Rights Commissioner, uh, in mid-February also issued uh, a separate report which also, uh, yeah, in which the, the message was uh, very clear, not only that Syria is not safe uh, for return, not in whole, not in part, uh, but even worse, that people who do return, uh, that they are uh, often specifically targeted by the regime for the mere fact of being a returnee for having spent uh, time abroad. Uh, so it's just not uh, just that all to say that it's not just a bunch of NGO reports making uh, crazy claims uh, about Syria safe or not safe uh, for return. Uh, it's also uh, the UN. Um, but then turning to uh, the second round, uh, which is yeah about recommendations. Uh, because we are, of course, uh, we are organizing this event uh, in the context of the Brussels 8 conference, uh, which yeah, we'll have uh, tomorrow, the, the, the first part, the day of dialogue, followed by the ministerial segment um, by the end of May, which, yeah, among other things, uh, will also produce uh, a chair's statement uh, with like the, the key um, yeah, strategic lines of the EU for Syria and, and, uh, and the broader region. Um, but we also have had yeah, other developments uh, in, in recent months, so by, at the end of last year um, the European Commission also published a report on the state of play of EU-Turkey relations, including the, the refugee uh, issue. Uh, there was the European Council uh, from two weeks ago that adopted conclusions both on the situation in Turkey and on Lebanon. Um, there's, uh, yeah, as I said, uh, this upcoming um, yeah, uh, deal with uh, with Lebanon, with a visit by von der Leyen uh, to Beirut. So, yeah, a lot of uh, policy momentum, it seems, not necessarily in the, the right direction, uh, but uh, nevertheless a lot of uh, yeah, traction and momentum. So, uh, an excellent time uh, to provide some key recommendations to the EU. Um, so, yeah, in no particular order, um, if you could share with the audience uh, very briefly, like, yeah, if there's like one thing that the EU can, should do in the short term to improve uh, the situation of Syrian refugees uh, in Lebanon, in Turkey, but yeah, in the uh, border region at large, um, yeah, what would it be? I will start. Uh, use the leverage with the governments of surrounding countries to stop the campaigns of forcible return of Syrian refugee and asylum seeker. Um, if, yeah. if you want, to, you have a bit more than a, a couple of sentences. <laughs> like you have. Yeah. Only one thing. I don't think it's gonna... <laughs> are you asking for one one thing? Two things are also allowed. Okay. All right. Um, so I mean, I think when it comes to Turkey specifically, and you know, some of the recommendations that we made in our report, um, you know, our report really fits into advocacy that Human Rights Watch has been doing, and that other organizations have been doing. Uh, with the EU uh, in terms of really clarifying that Turkey is not a safe third country and, and, and Shaima and Salah both um, spoke to that, uh, to the conditions there and, and what makes it um, a, a really a not a safe third country to which asylum seekers can be returned. This uh, report that I spoke about uh, and the conditions in Turkish occupied territories where Turkey is increasingly deporting um, refugees to uh, is really just another um, part of that puzzle, another, uh, you know, uh, piece that we would add to that advocacy. Because what you know, it's not just that conditions in Turkey um, are 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 challenging and dangerous, but also that where they, you know, the the areas that they declare or claim are safe, and that they are increasingly sending people to, um, are are you know absolutely not so and and where people are facing some very grave you know not just uh human rights abuses but but potential war crimes uh um in these in these territories so when it comes to turkey i would i would say that's you know one of our main um advocacy calls of course you know when we look at um the bigger picture 
it really does go back to, to the fact that root causes of the conflict have not been addressed. You know, torture, ill treatment are still rampant in government held areas, uh, detention facilities elsewhere as well. Uh, you know, the, the crisis of the missing uh, and the disappeared is this huge stain on, 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 um, uh, on Syria and, and how people feel about it. And it doesn't just affect those that have been disappeared, but their families and the societies they live in as well. And that is an ongoing violation. We're not talking about, um, you know, a past violation. People have been disappeared and that's just a past violation. No, that is an ongoing violation and one that affects, uh, you know, in the entire uh, the entirety of, 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 of Syrian society. So really the root causes remain unaddressed and no, you know, there's no political um, process or solution that can be found uh, without, without really addressing that. So accountability needs to be at the heart of every movement. You know, UN member states should follow through with, um, you know, investigations under universal jurisdiction. Uh, but of course, that's also not enough, and maybe in the second panel we'll get into that. Um, but yeah, I'll keep it there, Shema. Yeah, thanks. So basically, um, I think that going back to the same policies and uh, doing the same thing over and over again, we can only call it bad policy. Like, it's not that if we continue to, to do the same thing, that things will change, and it's very obvious that things are not changing. So the least we can do is that at least reconsider the way, at the, like speaking to the, let's say the EU in, in, a, in a very <laughs> direct way, like at least that we can do is that just reconsider the way funding is being streamed into, into those countries, like, like signing deals with like large amounts of funding apparently is not solving the situation. It's not even changing uh, the situation to the bat to the better in any way and we can see this that since 2011 up till now it's only getting worse and worse and then we continue doing the same every single year like it's not even changing a bit uh, in in any way and then we talk about the situations in the neighboring countries we talk about deportations uh, and which we they, they call voluntary returns or whatsoever so the bulk of the, the funding mainly goes to UN agencies. So the least that UNHCR can do is that at least have monitoring uh, uh, to monitor the borders, just to make sure that our, our claims are false or not. Just have someone to, to check whether people are being voluntarily returning to, to uh, Syria because it's safe for them to return or that it's just uh, forcibly returnees that are being forced through the border to um, to Turkey. Um, the other thing that I would uh, also <laughs> speak about is that resettlement. It's not, it doesn't make sense that we just ask countries to just keep dealing with, with situations, with all the economic crises all over the world. And just the, the, the solution is just like giving more funding without any single improvement to the resettlement uh, uh, to, to EU countries. Why does all the countries have to deal with this without any responsibility of the EU in terms of at least increasing the number of resettlements uh, easing the like the process of, of resettlement because we all know that it takes two, three, sometimes even more for one person to, to, to resettle to a safe country to the EU and we see that the situation is getting worse and worse and worse and then the solution that we get is just like okay sign, sign a deal with Lebanon and give Lebanon four billion euros because this is what will solve the solution or like this is what would like save people in Lebanon and not to be faced with deportations, uh, not even, not also Lebanon. <laughs> I, was, I was getting a bit personal here because I'm Lebanese myself. So basically in Lebanon and in Turkey and all the neighboring countries, it doesn't make sense that we just have deals, give money and that without any conditions also. Like we don't see uh, conditions to the funding that is being also given to governments. We do not monitor where the money is going. 
And then like there's a funny report. It was very funny for me because like it literally says an audit to the EU money that went to Turkey. And it literally says that the absence of certain information does not mean that they would change their funding policies and whatsoever. But on the other hand, the compliance that the EU gives to organizations like us or like even smaller organizations is crazy. But for countries, okay, like there are amounts of funding that we're missing, but okay, we don't have to look into it. And then we will continue to give the same amount of money to those same governments without any monitoring or without any conditions. I don't know, I'm, I'm going to stop. No. But the last thing is um, the, the compliance point is very important. Like, at least if you want to give money, just monitor the money. Where does the money go? The same thing that you do with, uh, uh, with organizations. You ask for bills for like three euros, like literally. Organizations are being forced to submit uh, documentations for financial compliance on like the, the smallest amount and then it can be considered ineligible because like they, they can't find a receipt for a three euros payment but with countries the report the audit report specifically says that the absence of certain information does not mean that the funding direction should change whatsoever so i think that at least putting some conditions monitoring where the money is going reconsidering the, the, the direction of the funding is also important because, yeah, I don't think if we continue doing the same thing, things will going to change in one way or another. Sorry for ranting. Yeah. Um, even if I may, uh, before uh, giving the, the last word to, to Salah, uh, a short follow up question. Um, also, looking ahead to the, the Beirut visit of von der Leyen. Uh, where yeah, it is widely expected that she will announce uh, yeah, some kind of package including additional financial support to uh, Lebanese security actors, uh, um, coast uh, border guards, uh, but also Lebanese army. So yeah, even setting aside for a moment like international law uh, or a potential uh, and then considering international law some kind of nice to have um, yeah, hobby project. One could also argue that it's also from a purely, yeah, strictly, say, a migration management perspective, it might also be counterproductive. Uh, do you agree? Yes. yes. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, you're outsourcing a problem um, to, again, we're talking about Lebanese security forces that we uh, that have been documented to act with um, you know, to to really, uh, you know, violate rights in the way that they are uh, deporting individuals. We're seeing a vicious crackdown right now, as, as Raghda has, has, has spoken to. Um, and, you know, it, we know we know that people are being sent back and still finding ways to get back out, risking, you know, very perilous journeys uh, uh, you know, by sea to try and get to European um, countries, you're only kind of moving or migrating um, a problem from one area to another um, and then having to deal with that as well. So you're just kind of, you know, closing this one door, opening that, trying to fix that, you know, fix that issue as well. And so it keeps, um, you know, again, we go back to this idea that, that the, the root causes remain and no matter how much you try to funnel money into, uh, you know, one context, um, the issue will kind of pop up elsewhere and you're still going to have to deal with it. Um, um, but I don't know if that's what you wanted me to get to, but. Sure. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, and Salah, yeah, the last word is for you before we go to the audience. And I will say that the Syrians are in Lebanon or in Turkey. أه وبأخص تركيا لأنه الإنسان السوري حاليا بتركيا يعني عم يتم معالجة وضعه القانوني تحت يعني مظلة إدارة الهجرة التركية وليس تحت مظلة دوائر الدولة التركية أي إنسان عادة يعني دوائر الدولة الرسمية هي بتم حل أمور القانونية الإجراءات اللي هو حابب إنه يتممها لكن بتركيا الإجراءات القانونية اللي عم عم تتم بحق اللاجئين السوريين من قبل إدارة الهجرة التركية اللي عم تستغل أي ثغرة موجودة 
باي اجراء عم يقوم فيه اللاجئ السوري عم عم يتم بانها ترحله قصريا بحجه طبعا انه في في نقص بالاوراق او في نقص بالبيانات او في نقص باي شيء يعني اخر قضيه اللاجئين السوريين بتركيا او بلبنان هي لا تقل اهميه عن اي قضيه انسانيه اخرى موجوده بكل العالم الانسان السوري او بتركيا او بلبنان وقت عم يتم ترحيله لمنطقه غير امنه بسوريا هو عم يتحول من من انسان منتج بالمجتمع اللي هو مقيم فيه لانسان يحتاج الى اعاله ويحتاج الى معونه لحتى انه يستمر بالحياه عدا عن الظروف السيئه اللي عم يتم تعرضه الى الحالات النفسيه اللي عم تمر عليه كثير امور للامانه يصعب شرحها ب ب بجلستنا هي شكرا للقائمين على الاجتماع على الندوه المركز السوري للاعلام وحريه التعبير شكرا لكم جميعا ثانكس ا سلام اوكي سو وير 5 مينتس باست 3 سو ذات ليفز اس وذ سفيشنت تايم فور كيو ان اي Uh, we have a couple of questions from uh, the online audience, but uh, I want to give uh, or reward the, the people who uh, came here in person uh, first. So, uh, are there any specific questions for the speakers? And I also maybe can already uh, say that uh, I got a very important uh, note uh, from my colleagues uh, that I cannot, uh, that I shouldn't uh, forget uh, to announce that from 3:30, uh, between 3:30 and 4 p.m. there will be a coffee break uh, in the room uh, next to this room. Uh, but first, uh, we have 25 minutes of. مرحبا يعطيكم العافية وشكرا على هالدعوة الاجتماع. أنا غادة حمدون صيدلانية من مدينة حمص والدة لصلاح دباغ وأعلامية. تعرضت خلال هذه في جلوسي في تركيا لاحتجاز لمدة يومين بسبب يعني عمل ابني في القانون والنشاط الإنساني طبعا عندي توصيات أماني من السيدات اللي كانوا محتجزات معي في الأزلي لمدة تقريبا خمسين ساعة كنا محتجزين ومعنا أطفال تصوروا أنه غرفة مساحتها لا تتجاوز ثلاثة أمتار توجد فيها أكثر من حوالي عشرين طفل وأمهاتهم معهم وآبائهم في نفس الغرفة كنا خلال يعني طبعا هؤلاء أنا كنت خمسين ساعة فقط هؤلاء العائلات كانوا محتجزين لمدات طويلة بعضهم عشرة أشهر بعضهم أربعة أشهر فقط ساعة واحدة للتنفس لهؤلاء الأطفال فرسالة أحملها منهم من هؤلاء السيدات وهؤلاء الأطفال طفلة صغيرة كان عمرها تسع سنوات عندما علمت أنه أنا أشتغل في المجال الإنساني طلبت مني أنه أن أنقل صوتها لأي مكان في العالم لرفع الظلم على مركز الاحتجاز اسمه أزلي منطقة أزلي في تركيا يعني لمن لا يعرفها من أجمل المناطق على فكرة ولكن حولوها لأسوأ المناطق بسبب هذا السجن الكري كلمة اليوم مجرد ما تذكر كلمة أغزلي في تركيا بالنسبة للسوري فهي معناتها الترحيل وهي يعني الألم يعني لا أستطيع أن هذين اليومين بالنسبة لي كانوا يعني كعشرين عاما أتمنى أن نصل صوت هؤلاء الأطفال هؤلاء السيدات هؤلاء العوائل لا ذنب لهم أحد الحوادث كانوا السبب احتجاز يلعبون في الحديقة صار يعني خلاف على الألعاب فكان يعني القرار باحتجاز العائلتين وأحضارهم إلى الأزلي تصوروا يعني ما هذا الذنب أطفال يلعبون اختلفوا على لعبة فكان مصيرهم الاحتجاز في الأزلي والترحيل عائلة أخرى كانت سبب أنه أحد أفراد العائلة مطا... الحكومة التركية تتهمه مثلا بقضية فدخلوا إلى هذا المنزل في المنزل عشرين شخص أقارب وضيوف عندهم احتجزوا كل العائلة والضيوف معهم يعني هذه قصص كثيرة لا تكتفي يعني 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 بدقائق أرويها لكم أتمنى أن أكون صوت لهؤلاء ويعني و... نساعد هؤلاء الناس اللي هني معتقلين ايضا مثل مثل المعتقلين في عند نظام الاسد شكرا لكم ثانك يو از ذير انيثينغ تو اد اوكي 
Thank you. Hello. Hi, I'm Giacomo. I'm the country director of Relief International in Lebanon. And uh, I lived in Syria for five years before. So first of all, I want to thank uh, Hiba because I think she provided a very candid uh, and accurate picture of the situation in uh, Turkish occupied areas, uh, which is exactly the opposite of the of the narrative about the safe uh, areas uh, in uh, in Syria. And uh, it's clear that there, I mean, it's a by the book example of uh, ethnic cleansing uh, and uh, and engineering. Uh, I was in Tel Abyad um, a few years ago, and uh, I mean, all the Kurdish population of this area has been displaced in Northeast Syria. And uh, and now they are sending their people that has no linkage with this, uh, with this area. So this is definitely something that uh, has to be flagged when it comes to the narratives about the safe areas in, uh, in Syria. Uh, at the same time, I would make probably a distinction between the area in the Northwest, I mean, the areas controlled by Turkish-backed forces like uh, Sultan Murat, Al Hamza Division, the one that you were mentioning, a distinction between these areas and Northeast Syria, where certainly there are uh, still pockets of instability, for instance, the resort, but there are also areas uh, where it's quite stable and the rule of law is, I mean, as much as it's possible, considering that all the potential for stability is stifled by the Turkish presence, uh, uh, but, uh, but where it's possible to have some rule uh, of law and maybe could also be possible to have some investments. So this brings me to, to my question, actually, which is uh, on the one hand, uh, I mean, uh, clearly there is no solution in terms of uh, uh, resettling the refugees that are in Turkey, in Syria, in Jordan, and partially also in Iraq to Europe, because we have seen that the, the, um, the will to do so is, uh, is not there. So what could be, I mean, I, I was in an event in Beirut a few, a few weeks ago, and uh, there was an Australian diplomat that mentioned that Australia in the past 13 years accepted the 25,000 refugees. I mean, 25,000, yeah, seriously. I, I, <laughs> and, uh, and so this is the level of effort that the West, besides providing these I mean, humanitarian peanuts to the, to the neighboring countries, uh, is doing. So is there, do you think there should be any discussion to restart uh, investing in Syria? Because obviously, on the one hand, it's extremely controversial, because uh, you have, uh, I mean, a genocidal government there, more or less. At the same time, though, pockets of stability are definitely there, and uh, also reading OHCHR uh, reports, and I want to read the one of uh, human, human Rights Watch that I didn't, but, uh, and very good point, by the way, mentioning the economic conditions as uh, a safety criteria. And, uh, I mean, if you're not a, a political activist, if you're not subjected to conscription, uh, I mean, the main issue for the returnees uh, is economic opportunity. You still, you also have returnees that went back to Syria and then had to go back to neighboring countries. So, I mean, how much the West should uh, create the conditions uh, for Syrians uh, to return with economic investments, uh, dealing with the government that no one likes, uh, but that unfortunately is there and is not going anywhere probably. So I don't know, I mean, if you have uh, any answer to this, but uh, I mean, certainly point of reflection. Thanks. You can answer first. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's an interesting question. Uh, of course, the, my answer is not the ultimate answer for this. But uh, I mean, the absence of conflict does not say exactly we all agree that does not mean that it is a safe area for return. And it's not only about the economic opportunities whatsoever, of course, economic opportunities are of priorities for whoever would decide also to return. But we can see this by the number of, let's say, economic migrants in the neighboring countries. Are they the majority of the migrants or the refugees in the, in the neighboring countries? Speaking of Lebanon, because I don't know in, inside Turkey, but speaking of Lebanon, they are not the majority of the, uh, of the population inside Lebanon. We know that the majority of the refugees in Lebanon are not migrant, economic migrants. This is one. On the other hand, the situation is not only linked to economic or the absence of conflict. We can see a lot of cases that Hiba also mentioned, for example, in Northwest, even though there, there are, for example, safe places that say potential safe places, but does it mean like, for example, is it safe for women to be there? We see, we've seen a lot of cases where women have been murdered for just 
being activists or speaking about women's rights inside North and in, in Northwest Syria, also in Northeast Syria. There's a lot of cases where people are not uh, like, especially women are targeted just for the for the fact that the, being activists or working in a humanitarian uh, uh, sector whatsoever. There's a lot of layers to call a place safe, and I don't. On a personal note, I don't see that the, the divisions or the authorities inside uh, Syria now are fit to, 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 to have a safe place whatsoever, because there is a replication of what the regime has already done in South and Central Syria or in Syria in general, and also based on what Hiba was saying, that we can see the same trends and the same uh, 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 way of dealing with things that the regime has done in those areas. But do we then say that having the same authorities, the same shapes with different names, this means that those areas are safe for people to go there? And how do we define safety? What is safe? Is it just like sitting in a place and not having someone bombing me or is it uh, like being safe from murder, being safe in terms of security and like food security, economic opportunities. There's a lot of layers that we can call safe, like for someone to feel safe. And then resettlement, it's not about resettling all the refugees to Turkey, or I mean not to Turkey, to the EU, but there's a lot of countries who are actually investing, which for me, it's a bit uh, um, funny, let's say. A lot of countries are investing in those countries. We cannot deny the fact that a lot of EU countries, the US, uh, whatever, we see them like Russia, Iran, and everyone, they are investing in those countries. And we can see that those investments are making us people live with those dictators that we are living with. And we cannot deny that. So I don't see that there is a solution in the near future, in a sense, to call Syria a safe place for a return. Because with the current situation, with the presence of the current authorities in the three regions, we cannot call it safe whatsoever. So thanks. Um, I just wanted to add to that point, um, because I, you know, I think that that question keeps us all up at night uh, a lot of times when we think about how depressing we see the situation in Syria currently. I think that question about when is it time to start investing, because putting you know, safety aside, and okay, we might talk about pockets of, of stability, uh, again, those are not sustainable, right? We don't know how long that pocket will remain safe or stable. We're talking about an ISIS resurgence in many, you know, in certain parts of Syria. Um, you know, things are, are, are maybe, you know, maybe there's no conflict, but they're not stable by any means, right? And, and things could change overnight. And we're seeing this new wave of violence currently that's, you know, uh, um, overtaking Syria. It's becoming a regional battleground or always has been, but even more so now. Um, and then, you know, Putting all of that aside, and we know that there's a lot of humanitarian actors now talking about early recovery or reconstruction. Reconstruction is a very um, bad word with bad connotations, and you can't say it. And you have to think about, uh, you know, how when is when is a, when is the right time to start reconstructing civilian infrastructure that has been systematically destroyed right across Syria, you know, water wells, electricity stations in the northeast. OK, we might say it's to a certain extent stable, but with the Turkish, you know, invasions and, and the threats of invasions and the most recent decimation of civilian infrastructure. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely you want some of those critical infrastructure uh, uh, reconstructed or renovated or whatever the current word is when it comes to that um uh and and you know personally i think there there should be some clear understanding of what early recovery means right and and what are we willing to uh you know putting aside people returning people that are currently in syria what level or what quality of life is there Right, and every person I talk to, whether it's in the Northeast or the Northwest or Turkish occupied territories or government held areas, everyone is struggling to make ends meet. Everyone is struggling 
uh, you know, to put to put food on the table, to get electricity for more than an hour a day. Uh, so I mean, that these situ that, that is just an undignified, um, undignified circumstances, and and it's not just safe. When, when we talk about returns, we don't, we shouldn't just be talking about whether it's safe, but whether it's dignified. That's the next step. We're not even, you know, we haven't yet met the threshold of safe in anywhere. I don't think, even in the northeast, in in the pockets that you refer to. Um, but then, but then, okay, safe, but is it dignified? And that's the next point. And I, and again, we go back. Although it sounds very. Um, uh, you know, like we're talking in big points, root causes, root causes, but really there needs to be certain steps. I mean, first step is access. There is no access to a lot of places, to a lot of detention facilities by UN agencies and other independent monitors. How can we figure out whether people that have returned voluntarily, you know, what happened to them after they returned, right? Again, after, you know, when we stop thinking about physical security, we think about housing and shelter and most people return to homes that have been damaged or destroyed and that they cannot renovate um so there's a lot of there's a lot of factors that are not yet in place for us to even start talking about investment and then and that's what right the syrian government wants and you know it is a point of leverage but again i don't know the answer to this when you know when do we start thinking about quality of life inside syria um as opposed to leverage. And I will keep it at, I don't know the answer to that. Sas um, Farouk. Hiba, maybe um, before uh, turning uh, to, to another question, there was also a related question specifically for you uh, from the, the online audience. Yeah. Uh, which, yeah, listening to you, uh, I guess might be a bit of a rhetorical question now. Uh, but oh, asking right. it anyway, um, so the question was basically about um, yeah, housing projects, like construction projects uh, in areas such as Afrin, uh, so where also NGOs are uh, involved in. So um, the question was from the audience was basically, to what extent do you think that these kind of yeah, organizations, NGOs and, and non-NGOs, yeah, are at risk of being complicit or are actually being complicit in processes of uh, demographic engineering? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and it's one that was beyond the scope of this particular uh, report that we that we put out, but uh, we did look into it and we do hope to look further into it. Um, but basically, you know, I do think there is definitely a risk of, um, you know, these NGOs being complicit in violations of housing, land and property rights. We're talking about, but again, this is a region that's been um, subjected to some sort of, you know, demographic re-engineering not just under Turkish occupation, but before that, before that as well. Um, and while a lot of these construction projects that we're seeing are not happening on um, in you know areas or, or residential areas that themselves were, uh, you know, their original inhabitants lived in those particular areas. Some of them are happening in in areas that had no construction before but what we saw in the beginning um you know after the first invasion in 20 second invasion in 2018 into into afrian um you know we saw a lot of resettlement from eastern ruta and other places um you know the the houses that already exist and that belong to the original inhabitants of afrian are now inhabited um not just by fighters and their families but you know members of displaced communities from elsewhere. Um, some of these homes have been turned into, into prisons, into, you know, black sites, detention facilities. Um, in some cases, uh, you know, uh, like non-state actors, institutions, you know, like governmental institutions. Um, but yes, I think, you know, as long as people are not able to return, to their to their lands and and we were just talking about how you know the northeast uh you, you I've, I've been to the northeast very recently and you know visited some of the camps there uh, and and the conditions are extremely dire um you know uh, but people aren't able to return to afrin or to ras al or to tal abyad um or even to find out what became of their homes and of their businesses and of their shops um and so as long as they're not able to return and there's no real you know, compensation 
for uh, those violations than NGOs that are building um, or, or contributing to the building of, uh, you know, residential tinder blocks or whatever those structures are, um, can risk complicity. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks so much for uh, um, putting this panel together and putting these things on the agenda and the and the great insights that you shared. I have uh, sort of two questions. First, um, because I know many of, of the organizations you work for are also engaged in, in advocacy. And I, I wonder if you could say a bit more about what are sort of the responses you get when you share this information and these insights? Because being very cynical, I'm not assuming that it's entirely new to, for instance, the EU interlocutors that you speak with. So, so what's, what can possibly be said against this on the one hand? And on the other hand, speaking to uh, um, this, this sort of prospective EU-Lebanon deal that's been uh, coming up a couple of times, um, I realize that's speculation, but could you maybe sort of go into a little bit of what that would practically mean on the ground for people, for Syrian people in Lebanon? Um, also in light of sometimes, again, quite cynical remarks that I've, that I've heard that um, Lebanese authorities don't really have a lot of capacity to sort of forcibly deport people anyway um, or prevent people from returning to Lebanon once they're deported. So, so in light of that, um, being the devil's advocate, of course, what would change with, sort of, with, with such a deal? Thanks so much. Thanks, Nora. And sorry, I forgot to ask, but can you briefly introduce yourself to the speakers? Yes. <laughs> I'm Nora Stel. Um, I'm a researcher at Radboud University in the Netherlands, and I'm doing research on forced deportations from Lebanon to, to the Syria. Um, can I delegate the first question to Shaima and then possibly the second question to Ragda on Lebanon specifically? All right. Okay, thank you. So mainly this is a I think it's a joke that we usually make after such meetings because we always receive kind of the same uh, responses. So lots of concern and lots of monitoring the situation. So basically, um, I'm, I'm just to be fair, like not everyone we meet in, in EU uh, at EU levels would say that, but like people who might have more influence on decision making usually the responses is that the situation is very concerning and I'm, I'm quoting. So the situation is very concerning and we are closely monitoring the situation. Uh, so, so this is not a very, um, let's say, um, yeah. It says a lot, I think, in a, in a way, because this is what we've all been hearing, whether from UN agencies or EU uh, uh, decision makers or whatsoever, is that yes. Uh, but we know that the situation is concerning. We already knew that the situation is concerning, and uh, but nothing uh, changes. Uh, sometimes it's more or less like there is a bit of interaction, let's say, but there is no actual uh, feedback or actual, uh, let's say, uh, um, acts of, you know, that there is something else that's going to happen. No, you don't get this. So, so that's that's mainly how we get it. And uh, to Rakhda. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shayma. I will answer this question in Arabic. بالنسبة للبنان يعني الكمال أخبار اللي عم تجي من الاتفاق مع الاتحاد الأوروبي تزامنت مع ظروف كتير صعبة بعد مقتل باسكال. خصوصي شفنا انه في كثير مدن لبنانيه وضيع انه عطت مهله للسوريين انه ياخذوا هي الضيع وهذا الشيء عمل كثير من الخوف بالنسبه للسوريين وبنفس الوقت في تجارب سابقه هلا شاركت شهادتين من ناس ترحلوا على سوريا وتم اعتقالهم واحد معتقل بصيد نايا والثاني انه كمان انسحب على العسكريه انه انجبر انه يروح على العسكريه بسوريا فهذا الشيء للاسف ما فينا نعرف الفيدباك تماما لانه كمان اللاجئين بسوريا ما عم نقدر نوثق شهاداتهم لانه عندهم خوف كبير من توثيق هي الشهادات لانه وضعهم بلبنان كثير صعب واذا ترحلوا على سوريا راح يكون وضعهم اكثر صعب اكثر وشكرا. يا سو بيزيكلي ا بيت مور اون ذا ديل لايك وات وي ار ريدينغ اراوند اند وات وي هير اراوند اتس مور اور ليس ا مايجريشن ديل سو ذا ايديا از نوت ذات 
the best it's for the best interest of refugees in Lebanon. So it's more or less just like stop those refugees coming to the EU. So more or less like controlling the borders and uh, a part of it would be for the capacity, as you said, of the Lebanese authorities, the Lebanese um, uh, army and uh, also the general security in a way. But the main <clears throat> direction is border control. Uh, so yeah, expectations, more or less a closed space, uh, more strict, uh, again, border controls so that refugees uh, would not be able to cross. Um, and also because it is linked with all the deals that we can see in the region. So the deal with Egypt, the deal with Tunisia, already the deal with Cyprus, it's more or less just, okay, secure this area and don't let anyone go out. And um, whatever will happen, the, the idea is when we talk about a migration deal with the current government or the previous governments, or even maybe I think the governments to come in Lebanon, we all know that it's a corrupt, uh, um, yeah, <laughs> it's more or less like money will come in and we've seen the amount of funding that has been streamed in Lebanon over the past 13 years with no actual change on the ground, meaning that the money would also be lost again because we're doing it in the same way and we're giving it to the same actors over and over again. So thanks. Yeah, I can briefly add on that also like, yes, as uh, Hint said before, uh, throughout the conversation, I think even ah, the, the main issue with what is uh, reportedly now on the table um, is that basically yeah, it's not grounded in reality. It's as, as said, uh, or as hopefully clear now, uh, it's based on the notion that Syria or parts of Syria uh, have become safe to return to, which is uh, purely wishful thinking. Um, also, yeah, another issue is, of course, the fact that uh, by providing uh, money, uh, more financial assistance, uh, to these, uh, to Lebanese uh, security actors, uh, the EU risks uh, yeah, to, to become directly complicit uh, in um, in human rights violations, in international law violations, uh, yeah, grave violations of the non refoulement principle. But again, yeah, as I said before, like even if you were to brush that aside as some nice to have, like respect for international law, whatever. Uh, even from a purely migration management or keep them out kind of uh, perspective, it's also a very bad deal. It's a very counterproductive deal because you're basically handing over, you're giving money to the very same guys that are at the root of the fact that so many Syrians are trying in record numbers to reach Europe. The, the fear of being forcibly deported, the fact that people are actually being deported uh, in, in record numbers is one of the, if not the key driver of this um, yeah, record high onward migration movements from Syrians to Lebanon. So if even if your concern is like to, to have less migration, then uh, yeah, you should not give money to the very same actors that are actually feeding this dynamic. Uh, sorry, I stepped out of my role as a moderator uh, for a second. <laughs> Um, but we still have uh, time for one more question, please. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll take uh, two tamam. questions. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. You. I'm Mahdiin Isu, from the Rabita Dar for the death of the Qasri. هلا السيدة هبة وشيماء حكوا عن موضوع العديد من الانتهاكات الحاصلة للسوريين بتركيا وسواء بمناطق الاحتلال التركي حابب عفوا حابب اركز على نقطة التغيير الديموغرافي اللي ح... اللي عم بيحصل بهاي المناطق هو تغيير يعني خطير جدا يعني بالإضافة أنا من مدينة رأس العين المحتلة السلطات بالإضافة طبعا وجود أكثر من ستين سبعين ألف شخص من أبناء رأس العين يمنع عليهم العودة إلى هذه المدينة كأحد الأمثلة بالإضافة إلى الأبيض وأكثر من مئتين ألف موجودين في عفرين وتقرير هيومن رايس ووتش الأخير كان يعني رصد هذا الموضوع بشكل أساسي الحديث عن المنطقة الآمنة بعتقد أنه يعني لا يمكن الحديث عن منطقة آمنة إلا المفروض أن تكون برعاية دولية يعني أبناء أحد الأمثلاء أبناء مدينة رأس العين يمنع عليهم دفن موتاهم في المدينة 
يعني اهلنا اذا بيموتوا بمدينه اخرى المهجرين يمنع انهم يجوا على مدينه راس العين ليدفنوا موتاهم لهذه الدرجه عائلات راس العين من الاكراد فقط ثمان عائلات من الختائرة ما في عائلة فيها شباب وبنات ما في ممنوع حدا يفوت على هاي المدينة منزل عائلتي كأحد الأمثلة ما محكي عن منزلي بمعنى المنزل لكن كأحد الأمثلة سيدتين عراقيات موجودات فيها من زوجات داعش أزواجهم عم بيقاتلوا بليبيا منزل عائلتي الآخر تم الاستيلاء عليه من قبل منظمة إيها ها التركية معهد الإغاثة الإنسانية التركية وتم تحويله إلى معهد تحفيظ القرآن ويمنع من على عائلتي أن ترجع لمدينة رأس العين هذا نموذج نموذج لما يتعرض له الناس بهذه المنطقة بالمخيمات الموجودة طبعا مش الأكراد لحاله بالمخيمات الموجودة بمخيم واشوكاني مخيم رأس العين والعديد من المخيمات الموجودة بمحافظة الحسكة هناك المئات من الأخوة العرب أيضا موجودين بهذه المخيمات أيضا ممنوعين أن يعودوا إلى هذه المدن موضوع التغيير الديموغرافي موضوع آخر خطير جدا بتمنى يعني هيومن رايتس ووتش تركز على هذا الموضوع اللي هي الدواعش الموجودين بمدينة رأس العين وبغيرها من المدن، آخر التقارير الحقوقية بتقول في أكثر من 120 عائلة داعشية موجودة حاليا برأس العين لحالة وأنا حكيت عن نموذج منزل اللي ساكنين فيه عائلة داعشية هي هذا أحد النماذج الموجودة، بالإضافة يعني لما لما بدنا نحن بنحكي عن موضوع عودة السوريين من تركيا أو إلى مناطق آمنة تركيا بالأساس بتمنع السكان الأصليين أن يرجعوا لهذه المناطق فبالتالي يعني هذا الشيء الأول والبسيط أن تسمح لأهالينا أن ترجع لمناطق في ظل ظروف آمنة عودة آمنة وطوعية وحياة كريمة لا يمكن أن يحدث إلا برعاية أممية وبرعاية دولية وبالتالي دائما بتكون الخطورة موجودة على هدول الناس اللي ممكن انهم يفكروا يرجعوا لهي المناطق لان الخطورة دائما بتكون موجودة اذا ما كان في رعاية دولية شكرا لكم Thanks. Uh, my name's uh, Matthew. I work for the Danish Refugee Council in uh, Amman in the regional office. I'll, ju I'll just ask a very one, one question because this panel elicits many and thank you for the information. But I think we only heard UNHCR mentioned once, which is about border monitoring. And I was kind of curious if, you know, as the UN mandated agency, when we see things like, and I know documentation isn't a panacea, we've heard of people being deported with documentation. But when we know that refugees aren't being registered, when we know that many of them uh, you know, can't access that kind of uh, support. You know, we, we don't see a lot from uh, the High Commissioner himself on the Syria crisis, I think, as much as this. Are there things that you think you'd like to see more of from UNHCR when it comes to Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey rather than inside Syria? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so mainly it's it's not only one thing that we would want to see from UNHCR. I think there's a lot of things. And uh, the, yeah, I think I mentioned them once, but uh, yeah, they should be mentioned in a lot of uh, situations also. Mainly there is a role that uh, UNHCR is not, is not playing, I think. It's not, I think, we can see that. Um, and it's a bit uh, a consensus that we don't see that the UNHCR is doing their role whatsoever. And uh, if you ask specifically about Lebanon, not in the terms of registrations, not in the terms of support, not in the terms of any services whatsoever. Even though that they receive the bulk of the funding, which is a bit crazy also, that they take all the money and then we don't see anything happening. So maybe this is one of the things that we should reconsider in one way or another of how the funding is streamed. We've been advocating for streaming funding to refugee-led organizations, and we see that, for example, the UNHCR, they have the innovative refugee funding. So basically it's focused on refugee-led organizations. It's 45,000 euros, 45,000 US dollars uh, per organization. And they just fund, I think, just not, to be fair also, I'm not mistaking, I don't think like more than 10, um, um, 10 grants are given uh, each year, which is for 450K out of the millions that are going there. 
So more or less, there's a lot of things like monitoring borders, being present, for example, when we talk about Turkey being present in deportation centers, making sure that there are no human rights violations when it comes to the situation of, of Syrians inside Turkey or even inside Lebanon. So yeah, so the role is, is absent on uh, I'm going to say on a personal note, just not to take everybody you with say me. say that on behalf of Tripoli. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so basically we don't see it. We don't see a role, to be honest. So it's not only one thing, as I said, there's a lot of things to, to, to happen, at least to play what they are supposed to be doing. So being the refugee support uh, in, in any way. So thanks. Well, and also the, the most obvious one is, of course, uh, actually monitoring conditions inside Syria. Um, because also what you see now is that uh, UNHCR has a state policy uh, that basically outlines that in order to move to like uh, large-scale uh, return programming inside Syria, there's this list of uh, UN conditions that they themselves uh, set, uh, UNHCR protection thresholds. Uh, that need to be met before one can talk about safe, voluntary, dignified return. But of course, then the million dollar question is like, how do you make that assessment if you're not monitoring it? So that would be a good starter. Final words? Yeah. Um, بالنسبة, uh, لل, um, طبعا الناس هنيك بتتمنى انه فعلا يتم تطبيق القانون يتم تطبيق القانون ما يتحول القانون حج عليهم ما ما لهم يعني الناس عم يعني حاليا صارت تخاف كثير من كلمة قانون مع انه نحن بنعرف كثير انه القانون هو وضع لحتى يتم حماية الانسان وينظم اموره المعيشية والاجتماعية لكن حاليا القانون بتركيا عم يلاحق الناس عم بحجج غير إنسانية غير أخلاقية فهذا الشيء يعني من أمنيات كثير ناس موجودين هناك إنه فعلا يتحول القانون ليطبق بشكل إنساني وصريح على مجتمع سوريا الموجود بتركيا أيضا يطبق القانون الدول الإنسانية بأنه أساسا سوريا تعتبر حاليا بأغلب المعاهدات الدولية والإنسانية إنه سوريا فعلا هي دولة غير آمنة وتلتزم هاي الدول يلي عم تقوم بعمليات التهجير القصرة للاجئين السوريين الموجودين بتركيا أو لبنان تلتزم بهذا القانون يعني اللي لحتى وقت يعني تتحول سوريا لمنطقة آمنة الناس لحالها هي راح تبادر وراح ترجع طوعيا ذكروا تقرير الهيومن رايت سوش إنه ما في أي إنسان يعني يمكن رجع طوعية من عنده إلا إكراها لمناطق, لمناطق الموجودة بسوريا فحاليا يعني حقيقة السوريين موجودين بلبنان السوريين موجودين بتركيا نتمنى أنه يطبق القانون عليهم حرفيا ما يتم أنه انتهاك حقوق بحجة القانون بس شكرا بدي أضيف نقطة أخيرة بخصوص التوصيات للUNHCR إذا في إمكانية لإقامة مرصد على الحدود يوثق حالات الترحيل ويكون في تفريق بين العودة القصرية المقنعة لأحيانا أنه بتدفع اللاجئين للعودة إلى سوريا بسبب الظروف الاقتصادية الصعبة أو المعاملات الإدارية الصعبة وبنفس الوقت يكون في نشر بطريقة شفافة للأرقام والأحصائيات لكل اللاجئين اللي عمالي يترحلوا لأنه للأسف كمان ما عم يكون في شفافية من الحكومات لما عمالي أنه تنشر هذه الأرقام شكرا. More Hiba to follow. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks everybody and thanks to all the panelists. Uh, so yeah, as I said, we'll have a short coffee break uh, in the room uh, next to this one. And uh, yeah, please stay on for the other panel that starts at 4 p.m. Uh, and which will focus on the search for justice and accountability in various parts of Syria. Thanks a lot.